ripped my blouse when I was putting it on with my ring, which feels like it feels like a what does it feel like? You know, why does it feels like that phrase? Why do the things we love hurt us the most? Because this is my favorite ring and it just tore my favorite blouse. But it's okay because I learned how to sew for this reason. I'm drinking orange juice out of a wine glass because it's like 9 a.m. <laughs> And I wanted to have something to hold. And also, sometimes I forget that I have complete autonomy. And as an adult, we can just do this stuff. I mean, this probably does feel a bit more juvenile. But for me, this is a marker of adulthood. I am an adult. I've made it. Look, mum. <laughs> I am here to talk about books and films. As per usual, it is March. Beautiful March. Beautiful spring. Spring has sprung. And I made it through my first English winter and everything is well and good again. And so in March, what have I read? What have I watched? I've read one, two, three, four, six. I've read six books and I've watched seven films. And one of them was technically in February, but I watched it in like an hour after I filmed my wrap up video. So we're going to count it in this video. The overall tone for March has been a lot of poetry and love letters. That's very much just a space that I'm in because I am also, I've spent a lot of time this month working on my own projects I've been incessantly chipping away at my novel so when I am writing fiction I can't consume as much fiction and so hence you will see some non-fiction poetry letter I'm about to dive straight into these 13 pieces of art that I have watched and read this month before I do a very quick word from today's wonderful sponsor you guessed it Squarespace calling in Squarespace <laughs> hello <laughs> If you are a writer or artist of any medium, which I bet you are because you're a part of my community, I am launching a literary and arts journal slash not-so-secret cult via Squarespace, where I provide a monthly prompt and you can create something based on that prompt and submit it, and I curate a lovely little world of art for you and others to consume. I crafted slash am still crafting this platform myself and it is quite involved, but luckily for me I'm partnering with Squarespace to bring it to you. Squarespace just makes the whole process of building a website so seamless and, dare I say, enjoyable. And I love Squarespace for turning passion projects into professional projects and morphing dreams and concepts into tangible realities. And this is just done so simply by the fluid engine design system and elements that I can eventually play with, like email campaigns and an online store. You can check out the collective at nowheregirlcollective.com and make yourself familiar until submissions open. And in the meantime, you can head to squarespace.com slash Dakota Warren for 10% off your first purchase if you want to build your own website or passion project too. As always, we're going to start with books. You know me, I have to do it in chronological order. And so the first book that I read in March, Louise Gluck's Poetry from 1962 to 2020. And this is a pretty big boy of poetry. You can see all of the little folds that I've made. When I make folds, it means it's a poem or a line or an extract that I really particularly adore and would like to access easily and go back to when I need to. And so this is marked full of them because I adore Louise Gluck. She is absolutely brilliant with her words. She won the Nobel Prize. Her way with words is so magical and it's so soft, but so strong. And she has this real penchant for spring and it's spring, who would have guessed it? So I read this in the transitional period between winter and spring, and this just made it feel so nice. I actually took notes in my journal about her poetry so that I could let you know, because I knew that a month later I'd not have it fresh in my mind. So I'm getting the notes up. Louise Gluck, consistent garden analogy for love and family, to build a home, to grow together, to prune, to water, to fertilize, to wilt through the seasons and blossom despite it all. Seasonal, because the change and transition and metaphor of seasons means so much to poets, especially Gluck. I saw a funny meme, uh, maybe I'll put it, if I can find it, I'll lay it over here. It said, uh, breaking news, poet is is torn about the changing of seasons or something like that something about spring and it made me laugh a lot a lot about the sea and bodies of water as is another theme that is so commonly very important to poets and authors and writers and artists alike because what is what is a body of water if not everything and nothing all at once i liked her meditations on hades and persephone and that whole 
that whole story because it gets that's one of the most controversial myths of course because you either believe that it was consensual and Persephone loved Hades and wanted to go with him or you don't and it, then it gets much darker all honest autobiographical reflections which seem to deepen with age of course ah to grow older and wiser that's that's my notes on this book I loved it a lot and I read it all in the same cafe not in one sitting though but I kept on going back to the same cafe and reading there and it was kind of like this little ritual that I had with myself for a few days in a row and it was very special to me I'm going to open up to a random underline and read it to you so that you have evidence that I in fact loved it I open to page 180 and what I have underlined is Jesus Christ all my life I have worshipped the wrong gods okay that's that I recommend that very much so and I shall put that there. The next book that I read is Women and Power from Mary Beard. And I took the slipcover off because if you're, if you're a frequenter of this channel, you know I hate slipcovers. Even if they're beautiful, they're coming off. <laughs> I am taking the slipcover off. It's a manifesto, and I think it was previously a lecture that's been turned into a book by popular demand. I think for an introduction to feminist literature and essays and theory, this would be a good one, but I didn't, it wasn't anything groundbreaking for me. And I read it really quickly because there wasn't, there wasn't many points. There weren't many points, grammar. There weren't many points that I needed to kind of sit back and go, oh my God, which is a marker of, which is a very important marker for me in general. That's this book. I forgot I had this. The next book that I read is Tracy Emin's memoir, and that is called Strange Land. Tracy Emin, um, whenever I whenever I read memoirs and autobiographies and biographies, I have to give like a brief rundown of the person that they're about. Tracy Emin is a contemporary artist. She's from Margate in England. She does a lot of a lot of conceptual art. She's controversial, but only amongst I mean, really only amongst men. I think she's incredibly brilliant. She's one of my favorite contemporary artists. She's such a powerful woman. She's such a powerhouse of a woman. She's so herself and she's so incredibly in her own voice. And it, you can just, you look at her art and you look at her and it's just so, she's so self-assured in what she creates and that it is herself. Her memoir is, it's another one of those real tell-all memoirs of somebody with a very insane and troubled and honest life this is a very honest memoir that did not skimp out on any details and i always appreciate and respect that so much from somebody who is writing their own memoir because that's so vulnerable to have to go through all this trauma again to bring it up as you rewrite everything you went through but write it in a way that makes it more palatable and digestible to the general public and also just so you can be guaranteed a book deal that's it's such a talent and such a feat and such a scary thing and so I really respected that in this book, as is most of the books that I recommend. There is a content warning. I like to read intense things, sue me. I respect Tracy so much as an artist and as a person, and I really recommend checking her out if you haven't already. One of her most notable pieces, she did this replica of her bedroom when she was at a very low point in her life. And you could walk around and see everything and it's got, it's very vulnerable and it's very honest and it's got all these, it's got, used wrappers and used condoms and just tissues and drugs and and alcohol and it's messy but it's real and it's wonderful and it's so vulnerable tracy emmons art is vulnerable and that's what i love about it i love artists that can just bear everything i think that's very brave her more recent works are primarily paintings and they're very abstract and so it's up to you if you're into that kind of thing. But as a, as a not usually abstract enjoyer, I enjoy them. The next book that I read, because I was on a kick, you know, when you watch my wrap ups, there's always going to be a theme and a chain reaction to this. I, when I was reading Louise Gluck, I felt like some poetry. Tracy Emin, I had just gone to the Tate Britain and seen her pieces there and thought, I'd love to know more about her life. What an interesting piece. Lo and behold, I went to foils. I got this finished this, wanted to know more, went back to foils, got this. I have so many books that I need to read, but when I have an interest in the moment, I need to go and get a new book about that interest. It's a good thing. That's a good thing because it means that you're reading what you're genuinely into at the moment and passionate about and care about. I'm just justifying it. 
This is Tracy Emin by Jonathan Jones, and it's a deeper dive into her pieces and her from somebody who analyzes them and critiques them. Beginning with her turbulent adolescence in Margate, Jonathan Jones examines Emmons' multifaceted career and the tremendous artistic talent that lies beneath her celebrity. From the previous unpublished watercolors that made up her student years through the 1990s and up to her very latest charged canvases, they also reproduced here for the first time. This book surveys the whole range of this enigmatic contemporary artist's work. The next book that I read, I was feeling like some love letters because I wanted to be reminded that love exists in a super chill, low-key way. Nothing to do at all with the fact that I broke up with my boyfriend or anything. This is Vladimir Nabokov's Letters to Vera. It's pretty big, actually. The first letter is from the 20s and the last letter is all the way up until the 70s. And so you see over, over 50 years how their love has grown and morphed and changed, but they still have this love for each other. And I think that's so special. And the letters that he sent her, because it's obviously one sided we don't see Vera's letters in here. We just see Nabokov's, Vladimir's, I should say, because they're both the Nabokov's. What I love particularly about this collection, obviously is Nabokov's way with words, is an absolute star with that, which will lead us on to the next book shortly. But I love this collection because we get to grow with them. And at the beginning, it's two young people who are falling in love. In the middle, it's two slightly older people who are married with children. And you start to see the shift in Vladimir's letters. He will send her, he'll draw trains and he'll draw cars and say, show this to the little one. And these scanned in and we get to look at them. And then towards the end, they're older and they get more rest. And it's just a lot more simple. And all throughout, whenever he has to go away on his little voyages for writing and that kind of thing. He'd always send back, he'd make all these puzzles, he'd make her crosswords from scratch and try and keep her entertained and busy. And it just, it just seems like a special, really special, unique love. So I really enjoyed reading this. It made me feel very good, but also sad, but also happy. The final book that I read, I've been talking for so long. God, whenever I have a microphone, I just don't stop talking. Uh, The final book that I read, and I have not quite finished this yet, but I'm filming this just before the month is ending and I will have finished it. And that's Nabokov's Lolita, which is a reread. But just reading Nabokov's words in voice, I thought to myself, I have to reread Lolita, I have to. And I know there's so many other Nabokov books that I could have read slash reread, but this is a favorite. And if you feel weird at me saying that, then A, you've either not read the book and just watched the film, or you've not even seen the film, you've just seen the Tumblr posts or the TikTok posts about the romanticization of it did i cor- did i pronounce that correctly romanticization yeah this is a brilliant piece of literature and if you've read it if you've studied it if you've analyzed it even if you've just read it with a little bit of critical thinking you realize that it's not romanticizing anything it's not romanticizing shit in fact it's damning it we know full well from the first page how unreliable the narrator is we know from the first page that this is not going to be anything but messy and ugly but the way that Nabokov approaches this is so unique, hence the brilliance of it. The prose in this is unlike prose that I've read anywhere else, which is testament to Nabokov's way with prose. And if you've read Nabokov's poetry as well, the lyricism in that just shows everyone knows what this book is about. I don't need to go into it. Delusional older man convinces himself that he is in love with a young girl. Awful premise. Awful, awful premise. We know this. Every time I talk about Lolita on my platforms, and obviously I talk about literature I love a lot, and I love Lolita, I have to be so careful about it. I have to be so careful about it, and I'm so sick of having to be careful about it because it's just, if you if you think that it's a problem that people think this is a good book, then you are the problem. You either didn't read the book correctly or you haven't read it at all. Rant over. <laughs> Critical thinking exists for a reason. I love the way that I just stressfully swilled my orange juice. Like it was a glass of wine after my rant. Like, oh, I need a drink now. <laughs> Swills orange juice from McDonald's Happy Meal. We are now onto films. And so for films, I must get up the letterbox account, which is the tracker. Two of these films I watched at the end of February, but just towards the end. And they did make it into my last 
wrap up so i'm going to put them in this wrap up but just know that they were in february the first film that i watched was a rewatch, and that's natural born killers from 1994 and this is kind of like a bonnie and clyde spin-off in a way it's set in america i kind of that kind of a what do they call it what's the american word for outback they voyage through that and they rob people and they hurt people and they kill people and they're fun and they're having so much fun but they're so in love and they're so young and they get caught and then they try and escape prison and it's this whole thing it really is just like a bonnie and clyde spin-off and i'm pretty sure i think something like quentin tarantino wrote the script but didn't make the film and somebody got rights to it and made it and apparently quentin tarantino said that they did a complete injustice and he doesn't want to be associated with it but who's a director oliver stone but i mean I can't help it. I love this film. Guilty, guilty pleasure. That crazy kind of love. They love each other so much. So, so, so much. They'd do anything for each other. Anything. Maybe I'm the problem. It's got Woody Harrelson and Juliet Lewis. And so, you know, it's going to be good when they're in it. It's just, I like it. I can't help it. I love the way they love. I also love the editing style. It reminds me a lot of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. It's quite experimental and it's very psychedelic. I enjoy it. The next film that I watched is The Color of Pomegranates from 1969. This film, I was recommended this from somebody who is a self-proclaimed film freak. And so when they recommended me this and said, you have to watch this, if you're gonna start anywhere with experimental cinema you need to watch this and so i did this is directed by sergi parajanov i have probably said that wrong i'm so sorry and it is a poetic evocation of the life of armenian poet sayet nova this is undeniably undoubtedly 100 percent one of the most beautiful films i have ever watched now i get distracted very easily when i watch films i always have to be doing something with my hands or whether it's eating or just having a cup of tea or writing in my journal or something. This film, I could not peel my eyes away from the screen and it's not in English. It ha- doesn't have that much dialogue at all, actually. It's mostly just music. And so it's not like I had to be looking at the screen to see the, the dialogue or anything. It's very much, I just couldn't peel my eyes away from the screen because it was so beautiful. Every single still He's like the OG Wes Anderson, but I feel like it's doing injustice to him by saying that, even though I love Wes Anderson. I wrote, I was hypnotized, captivated, bewitched. This is pure poetry, so little language needed to convey so, so much. This is going to be a huge inspiration in my future visual works, I can already tell you, and I still stand by that. It is such an, all I can say is watch it. It's beautiful. Next, I watched Tony Erdman which is 2016, directed by Maren Aid. And this is a film about a father coming to visit his daughter abroad. And she's got this really intense job and she's losing her sparkle and she's stressed all the time. And this father believes it's his duty to come and make her life happy and silly again. But what he does is he tags along and kind of just sabotages everything. And it's a really stressful, hard, annoying watch. But then at the end, it's kind of heartwarming and wonderful. And I watched it because it's got Sandra Hewler who was in anatomy of a fall and i think she is magnificent so i wanted to chase more of her works and i'm glad that i did this film was funny and absurd and there's one scene where everyone takes their clothes off and i'm not going to spoil anything apart from that because you won't know when it's coming if you watch it but it's just so silly but so good and it's it's a german film that i believe that they're in bucharest for the setting The next film that I watched, I don't even want to talk about. This is Miller's Girl from 2024, directed by Jade Halley Bartlett. Why would you make this movie? Why would you make this movie? The current rating universally is sat at 1.9 star. I gave it one star. And my, my review was, so glad this didn't exist when I was 14. This is a film about a professor and a student having a fling. I watched it because I saw everyone talking about it on TikTok and I had to join in on the fun. This is a stupid film. I can't remember her name for the life of me, but the girl who plays Wednesday Adams, she's really good, but what's her name? Jenna Ortega, that's it. And the professor is Martin Freeman. I didn't expect to see Martin Freeman playing a 
predatory professor but there we go it was just it was it's it was a waste of time kind of film i mean i just had to watch to know what was going on in the tiktok community of the outrage but then some people are posting edits romanticizing it it's just a silly film didn't have any plot was horribly misogynistic i mean the only female characters were all slutty wandering around drunk all the time and all the men were super sophisticated professors it's so silly i mean a woman directed it anyway the next film that i watched was i was invited to this with dazed and Mubi at a screaming and this is a last year of darkness from 2023 directed by ben mullenkerson and this is not something i would usually watch so i'm so glad that i went to the screening of it because if i was scrolling Ruby myself i probably wouldn't have selected this but this was brilliant this is unlike anything else i've ever watched it's a documentary that follows the queer youth of chengdu is i probably saying that i'm probably pronouncing that wrong it's very visually stunning it's visually breathtaking and the shots and the sounds and everything it's just so intense and so real and so fast and you feel like you're there with them and it's a, it's a massive exploration of queer identity and drag and how much that scene and that sacred space means to the youth of such a rapidly changing country i was captivated the entire time through which is whenever i say that you know you know it's a really captivating film when i say that because i don't get captivated by films very easily but that was special and i believe it's on movie to watch now so you can watch it yourself and i thought it was fiction the entire time through until the very end of the the very end of the the interview because we had the cast interview after the screening and someone said blah 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 documentary and i i, I remember i my, my head snapped up and i thought to myself oh these people live like this that's badass the next film that i watched was backspot 2023 Directed by D.W. Waterson, my friends invited me to this because I'm pretty sure it was produced by Elliot Page and I wanted to see what he would come up with. I didn't like this film. I didn't. I'm sorry. It just felt like a queer bring it on, but not in like a good way. Every potential plot point kind of fizzled to nothing. And it's, it's just a bunch of cheerleading. I think that the acting was well done, but there was too many montages. I don't know. Not for me. I remember sitting in there. I had a Cadbury cream egg. If you're American and don't know what that is or from anywhere else in the world, it's this delicious little, delicious little, it's my favorite, it's my current obsession. It's delicious little egg, an Easter egg. And it's filled with all this goo. It's delicious. And I've been eating one a day, which is probably awful for me, but they're so delicious. I had one of those and I was so bored in the film. There I said it that I tried to make that singular cream egg last the entire length of the film without it melting on me, just taking like a grape of chocolate on my teeth. The next film that I watched, I also gave one and a half stars. Okay, I haven't, I didn't have a very good watch month, but I also had a very good watch month. I had a varied watch month. The last film that I watched was called Touch Me Not from 2018, directed by Adina Pintil. I watched this because Mubi told me to watch this and I do what Mubi tells me to do. Wish I didn't watch this. Together, a filmmaker and her characters venture into a personal research project about intimacy. On the fluid border between reality and fiction, Touch Me Not follows the emotional journeys of characters, offering a deeply empathetic insight into their lives. It's basically about people who are afraid of intimacy but crave it, but it doesn't really say much, in my opinion at least. It's very experimental. It's very, very daring. There was a lot of montage scenes of just people having sex and not much else that could provide substance there was some people talking and i wish there was more people talking so i could talk about how they felt anyway that's all the films that i watched that's everything am i still recording i am thank god last time that i filmed a video i had my microphone the entire time and i was speaking and i hadn't turned the microphone on thank you for being with me during these incessant rambles of the literature and films that i read and watched in march I'll be back with you in April. And until then, I'll see you next time. I wonder what my next video will be. I never plan them. I always just make it up as I go. <laughs> I love you. Tell me what you read this month as well, of course.